Well, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker tonight. Uh, he is also a radio show host, and I'll let him give you the details on that. And uh, so here you have it, Mr. Jack Otto. Thank you, friends. 65 years ago today, God Almighty put me on this earth, and I believe it's to fight against this new world order. Thank you, and happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. We are being cornered like cattle into a pen, squeezed down, and we're never really going to be free people unless we're brave. Because this was only the land of the free as long as it was the home of the brave. And this started a long time ago with people that go back to the well, fourth century. Let me tell you about the flight of the Khazar warriors out of northern Turkey in 500 AD. They were a despicable bunch. You could go to the king of the Khazars and rent an army from him, an army of 40 or 50,000 men. But it didn't matter what kind of a deal you struck with their monarch. He wasn't called a king. He was called a shagan. Once the battle was done, they rape and pillage. Doesn't matter what kind of agreement you had with the king. That's the way it ended up. And so as a consequence, people in the area garnered a great deal of animosity for these Khazar warriors. And in 500 AD, they were driven out. And as they came down south out of uh, Turkey, some fled to the west into Romania and Hungary and became the gypsies. The rest followed their monarch, the Chagan, up into the steppes of Russia uh, and north of there to the uh, Caucasus Mountains. And as they settled in there, they relatively, well, they quite easily enslaved the relatively peaceful agrarian Slavic folks that were indigenous to the area. Then they came under pressure to take sides in a growing contention around them. Coming down from the north was Eastern Orthodox Christianity, and coming up from the south was Islam. And they knew that if they succumbed to pressure from either of those to join their organization and embrace their philosophy, it would surely offend the other. And so what they did was a politically expedient maneuver. He called in all the religious leaders of the area, and he got their input. And after the input, he announced for me, and my people, and we're talking about 20 million people and about 4,000 nobility, for me and my people, we choose to become Jews. Now, this was not a heartfelt conversion. This was not something that was deep in their breasts that they felt they needed to uh, make a conversion because they thought that was the proper way to serve the Creator. This was something that was done as a political expediency. And in the course of studying about their new religion, and you do have to study it even if you're only going to charade, it is absolutely necessary to study about it so that you can fake it. And in the course of doing so, they came across a character with whom they could truly identify. It was Lucifer, the morning light that fell from grace and became Satan, the adversary. And they formed an inner circle within Judaism dedicated to the forces of evil. Let's define terms. What is a Jew? If you look back in your Old Testament, your Bible, there was 12 Hebrew tribes. The 10 northern tribes were called the House of Israel. The two southern tribes were called Benjamin and Judah, more properly pronounced Judah, because we didn't get the harder sound to the J until about 200 years ago. So this is what I would call real Jews, people from the tribe of Judah. And when we start talking about the New World Order, we are not talking about these people at all. We're talking about these Khazar warriors that only pretended 
to embrace Judaism. And so today, we find that about 92% of the people who claim to be Jews really aren't. They don't have a drop of Semitic blood in their veins. They are Khazar warriors with a new bent on life and a goal to conquer, to rape, and to pillage. And that philosophy has come down over time and we see how effectively they have implemented it throughout history. Now, when they pretended to embrace Judaism, they drew upon the real Jews for some education. And they used the Hebrew alphabet as phonics to codify their Khazar language. And so now we look at that language called Yiddish or Zhidish and find that it is not Hebrew. It only appears to be. Now these people have run into some trouble over time. In 965 AD, they were overrun by the Varganians, which was Swedish-ruled Slavic people. Varganian is the Russian word for Vikings. And they were militarily defeated, which curbed their expansionist philosophy for some time. And then in 1140, they were literally overrun by the Mongols for uh, Kublai Khan and Genghis Khan. And they were driven down into Eastern Europe. Their monarch, the king, or Chagan as he was called, fled to um, Spain and Portugal. Now, because these folks were a, a darker uh, skinned people with black hair and brown eyes, it was easier for them to fit in with the folks of Spain and Portugal and Italy and Sicily than they could other places where they stood out and looked markedly different. And they took a great deal of control, in, especially in Spain and Portugal, so much so that they were discovered in conspiracy because they worked together to get themselves, one of them, into a position of authority where that person can work in tandem with others to get more of their people in the authority and positions of power and working it up to where they're running the show and milking everybody else. After they fled down into Europe, there was one of them, a guy by the name of Meyer Amschel Bauerberg, who decided to enter into clandestine world government. Meyer Amschel Bauerberg used the symbol outside of his father's silversmith shop, a large red shield, as inspiration for an alias. And he went by the name of Rothschild. That's German language for red shield. Now Rothschild was born in 1743 and when he was in his late 20s, he formulated a financial enterprise with 12 other entrepreneurs with the dedication, with the interest and the intent of conquering everybody and everything. They were going to do it with fractional reserve banking, and that turned out to be a very successful tool. We found out about fractional reserve banking at the Bank of Amsterdam in 1610 when, like all fiat money inflations, it came to a roaring bust. And they learned from that and wanted to implement it wherever they could so that they could be the ones that profited from, benefited from that enterprise. Now, Meyer Amschel Bauerberg had five sons, and he took these five sons, and as they became of age, he sent them to foreign countries to operate not an independent banking system, but one in conjunction with the rest of their people, a system whereby Nathan, who went to London and soon proved himself to be shrewd, 
There was one named Coleman who passed himself off as Carl, and I think he went to Amsterdam. Uh, Jacob called himself James in Paris. And we find that throughout the world, in five big locations, they had banking institutions that had a very clever idea. And if these people weren't so evil, it would have been easier to admire what they did. But they had a system whereby you could go to one of the banks in one country and deposit gold with them and get a receipt for it. And then go to the foreign country where they had another office, take that receipt and get your gold. And you didn't run the risk of losing your gold on the high seas, either to wind or to pirates or anything else. So in a way it was kind of a, a clever scheme, however. Uh, these people were despicably evil and their intent to make money was to not just put themselves for their head, but to hold others back. Now, Meyer Amschel Bauerberg uh, lived to be, uh, well, he lived from 1743 to the year 1812, and that's why we got that 1812 overture, was to honor him. His associates respected him and wanted to salute his passing. Meyer Amschel Bauerberg changed his name to Rothschild and he also dropped the Bauerberg suffix and called himself Bauer closer to home where he lived there at 148 Judenstrasse in Frankfurt, Germany. They later moved down to 148 Judenstrasse and it was from there that he was able to do much of his chicanery and he got in league with a guy, William the Ninth of Hesse Castle. Now, if you remember about the Hessian warriors, the Hessian warriors were something that were uh, warrior slaves that was purchased by the King of England from this landgrave of Hesse Castle. It would, they were purchased for the price of twelve thousand dollars. And much of that money was earned by just capturing these people uh, through actual out-and-out -out brigand slavery and holding them until they could be sent to the king, and which they were told, don't ever let those colonists get a hold of you. They will skin you alive. Well, when the Hessian uh, soldiers got captured by one of us, and they, one of our forefathers, they started crying, oh, please don't skin me. And they said, well, skin you? We're not going to do that. Then they realized they'd been lied to. Many of them came over and joined the revolutionary forces of the Americans, and a lot of them escaped out to the West and melded in and became um, what we might call squatters out there in the wide open West like the rest of us did. Now, they did a pretty good job of interfacing with the Native Americans out there and were able to garner some respect for them. So it was among these same people that brought about so much of the war that we see in front of us throughout history. It was fomented primarily for profits and to scare us into believing that the only way that we could circumvent this war to get this behind us is if we were to form a league or united nations. Now the first attempt was when they had their man Napoleon. Now Napoleon was the Emperor of France but he came from Corsica and it was shortly after Corsica was brought into the French Empire that he was given the nod to become the emperor and to engage his war. Now this was shortly after that French Revolution. You know I'm going to go back and take a step back here and talk about that French Revolution for a moment. See it was shortly after there, a man named Adam Weishaupt in May 1st of 1776 formulated an organization called the Illuminati. This was done on behalf of Baron Rothschild and it was for the express purpose of fomenting their plans and 
uh, executing their goals uh, for conquest. Now, Adam Weishaupt encapsulated a game plan to bring about this world government. And in this game plan, he had it uh, mentioned in there that they were to take France in the year 1789. Now, these plans were formulated into writing and translated by one of the Ingolstadt University professors, one of Professor Weishaupt's cohorts, a guy by the name of uh, Xavier von Zweck. Now, Zweck uh, translated these into French so that they could be taken to Paris and Silesia. Now, there was a courier, a guy by the name of Lanz, who had been a, an evangelist minister, but quit God and decided to become an Illuminati uh, agent and a courier. And he was taking these materials by horseback through Bavaria. Uh, in a place called Regensburg, he was struck by lightning, and it killed both him and his horse. And people found this man, this dead man and his horse, with documents in the pouch. And these documents were passed up the chain of command to the elector of Bavaria, who got to wondering, is there really a gaining plan out here to conquer the whole world? So he staged, staged simultaneous raids on Rothschild's uh, associates, uh, primarily on Weishaupt's associates, and found a great deal of corroborating evidence, enough to convince him that there truly was a game plan out there to take the whole world. And there were six points to their game plan. They wanted the abolition of all religion, the abolition of property rights, of inheritance. And the worst one was down at the bottom of the list, the abrogation of the family. Now, we can see how that was implemented in Red China. Men went to one dormitory, women went to another dormitory, boys were here and girls were here, and the family was totally destroyed, and they used that to brainwash those people. When you got kids with no control over them except the one facilitator or his associates, the children are at their mercy. And it's planned for here, for us, for our children, for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. They intend to show no mercy. Now this formulation of the Illuminati led them down the road to this, this game plan wherein they are working diligently to take over the whole world. And in the course of doing so, when this courier was found, the elector of Bavaria, one Theodor von Dahlberg, decided after he staged those simultaneous raids that he was going to contact every head of church and state in all of Europe and gave them a translation of the documentation that was found in the pouches of that dead courier, that apostate minister named Lanz. And so it was after the Napoleonic War when Napoleon ran into Lord Wellington at Waterloo and was stomped. Now, this would have been a big setback for Mr. Rothschild, but Mr. Rothschild had one of his associates following the war along. And this associate sent a message back to him by carrier pigeon. And the carrier pigeons let him know that Wellington had won. So what he did was he, he was in uh, Paris at the time, and he jumped in a boat, and he had some men take him through some terribly dangerous seas. Too bad he didn't get it right then and there, but nevertheless, he made it to the other shore, to Great Britain, and he sold all of his British uh, financial securities. 
And then he started acting all oh, so scared like, and let the rumor out that Napoleon had won. Well, if Napoleon... Well, if Napoleon had won, everybody realized that their government was not going to be able to honor its financial obligations, and so they started selling theirs. And at the very depth of that despair, he quietly and surreptitiously had some of his friends start buying up those worthless securities. And so almost overnight, he increased his wealth by 21-fold. Now, it was time to disappear for a little while. He wasn't really popular because he had put out a false rumor that Napoleon had won. And when people found out that Napoleon hadn't won and they'd sold their government securities based on a lie, they were a little bit disappointed. But Baron Rothschild was in a position now where he could force a reformation of the Bank of England and cause his people to be put in positions of power and authority. And so, as a consequence, what it turned out well for him. It turned out way too well for him. So it was after this Napoleonic Wars that they had this big, big meeting in Vienna. The Rothschilds had his dignitaries assemble others from around the world and they said it is the scourge of war that plagues us and if we're ever to get rid of this scourge of war we're going to have to have some kind of Congress where nations can come together and we can live through this modern age. One of the attendees was the Tsar of Russia. And he remembered the documentation that he had gotten from the Elector of Bavaria, and he had studied it. And he knew about this program by the Illuminati to take over the whole world. And he got up in the middle of that meeting and he denounced the whole process. He pointed out that it was Weishaupt's plan to overthrow all governments and religion and take over the world in behalf of his organization. And he was the man personally who shot down the Congress in Vienna and Rothschild hated him for it. And he swore that he or his heirs one day would destroy the entire Romanov family. And we saw that happen. Well, it was before our times. We didn't personally get to see it happen, but we sure have a recording of it in our history books. That in November, of November 8th of 1917, I believe it was, that they went in and took over, killed the entire Romanov family, the Tsar and all his children. There's some speculation that one daughter, Anastasia, got away. And another son is uh, alleged to have gone off over to Poland and become a military officer under an assumed name. There's lots we don't know about what went on. Lots we probably never will know about what went on. Because everything has been based on deceit and lies. And we find ourselves boxed into corners based on these untruths. So it was shortly afterwards that they had another man from their group, a guy by the name of Abraham Lincoln, whose real name was Springstein. And Abraham Lincoln Springstein uh, went about fomenting the Civil War here. I'd like to call it the War of Northern Aggression because we've been lied to about that so much. We were told that was a, a war over slavery, but it wasn't. 
There was a war over states' rights. Two of the southern states, Virginia and North Carolina, had long ago outlawed slavery. And yet, it was used to rally northern forces. You know, that's the kind of thing I'd, I'd be willing to take part in. I would like to stop slavery wherever it could be found. And I'm sure it appealed to a lot of people to put an end to that despicable act of holding another human being like you would an animal and making them work for whatever you feel like giving them. Now, Abraham Lincoln had right in his cabinet a guy by the name of August Belmont. August Belmont wasn't his real name. His real name was Schoenberg. He was a Rothschild agent. And down in the other camp, they had a Rothschild relative, a guy by the name of Judah Benjamin, who was the head of the secret police down there. And after that, Abraham Lincoln resented his involvement with these people. And he made a speech in which he said, I feel at this time more fear for my nation than any other time, even during the war. An era of corporations has been enthroned and corruption will grow in high places. And we will end up with the wealth of many aggregated in the hands of the few. Now his resentment resulted in action and he decided he was going to issue greenbacks. He'd, he'd had enough of working with these people and they would not put up with that. So they sent in one of their own, a guy by the name of John Wilkes Booth, a bad actor, who dispatched Abraham Lincoln so that, and it was done in conjunction with the uh, Jesuits. See, there are so many of these Illuminati organizations out there. The one we just described by Adam Weishaupt was called the Bavarian Illuminati. There was another Illuminati called Avion, over in, I believe, in Great Britain. There was one in um, uh, Switzerland. And there was another one in France, uh, the Grand Lodge Orient de la France. And there's a very important one called the Alumbrados that was formulated in Spain. Now the Alumbrados is Spanish for enlightened ones. And the Alumbrados only existed for about 20 years before they changed their name. They changed their name to the Society of Jesus. They called themselves the Jesuits and they pledged themselves as the protectorate of the Pope. And when you got the Illuminati protecting you, it's the kiss of death. Well, we find about the time that this civil war was over, there was a guy who had been born in Boston, Massachusetts in December 30th, 1809, a guy by the name of Albert Pike. He was an impressive intellect. He was a Harvard graduate back when it really meant something. He was the master of 16 languages and he was a despicable son of a... <clears throat> because he openly uh, worshipped Satan. He was part of an organization called the Palatalists. He was the one that converted this Knights of the Golden Dawn to the Ku Klux Klan. And he was the author of a book called Morals and Dogma. It is the most revered text among the Masons. And in this text on page 321, Albert Pike, said, it is Lucifer, the morning light, whose seething energies you must learn to control or implement. So it was this Albert Pike, the same guy that wrote a letter to his superior in the Illuminati, a guy over in Europe by the name of Giuseppe Mazzini, who was the revolutionary leader. And Giuseppe Mazzini also happened to be the founder of the Mafia. This letter that he wrote to Giuseppe Mazzini on August 15 of 1871 
outlined three world wars. And the first of those world wars was to be fomented between the differences between the German nationals and the Brits and end up with the downfall of Tsarist Russia and the rise of communism. Any of us who studied any history at all knows that's exactly how World War I took place. Then World War II was fomented between the Zionists, uh, between the German nationalists again, and the Brits to bring us in. And in World War II, Israel was to be born. And the Zionists were given power. So since the first two wars came off just exactly as that letter said, and that letter used to hang right in the British Museum Library until 1977 when Baron Rothschild became a director. And as soon as he was on the board of directors, that letter disappeared from the library. Immediately. But since that letter so clearly delineated the first two world wars, I think we have to look at it seriously and take it to heart when it says in there so clearly that the third world war will be fomented between the Zionists and Islam. Does anybody see that materializing today? Every place we look, we can see it happening. And we can see that the power they have here in this country to run things and to pull the nastiest little scams and America believes it. Because they don't realize who it is that owns the newspapers. They don't realize who it is that owns the television. And sometimes they don't care. As long as there's going to be football on the Monday night and I got beer at hand, that's all that counts. Well, at least for a lot of people. And I think once they find that they have let their children and their grandchildren slip into tyranny, they may regret it. But regrets never come at the beginning. They always come at the end. We can see World War III shaping up just exactly like they planned for us. And not enough of us are doing what's necessary to stop it. Look at all the empty seats we have here. America should be flooded to this cause. They should be interested in what is transpiring. They should be interested in who's doing what and to whom. It was right after World War I that J.P. Morgan was given the job of gaining control of the newspapers. They knew they must be able to control human thought with input. And if you can realize that the human mind is a whole lot like a computer, the old garbage in, garbage out effect takes place. If you can control what people hear and see, then you can pretty much control what they think. And they were able to utilize newspapers and now radio and television for just exactly that purpose. Now, there were 78 newspapers, major ones, that they really needed to get control of, but J.P. Morgan thought if they got 25 of them, that would be enough to control things, but it wasn't. They realized soon afterwards that they had to get all of those newspapers under their control. And we got the likes of guys like David Rockefeller who announced that he wanted to thank the people of the Washington Post and the New York Times for respecting their pledges of discretion at the CFR and Bilderberger meetings. 
And he said if it wasn't for their discretion, it would not have been possible to prepare the world for a new world order. Oh, we heard George Bush say that a lot, didn't we? George Bush Sr. He was always talking about new world order. When he went into Iraq, he said, this is much more than about one small country. This is about a big idea, about a new world order. There's a lot of people don't even know that on the back of their dollar bill where they see that all-seeing eye of the pyramid, what that means. They don't realize that's occult symbolism that was put in by these Satanists during the Roosevelt administration by his vice president, a guy by the name of Wallace. They don't speak Latin, so they don't realize that Inuit Coepidus up at the top says announcing our enterprise. They don't realize down at the bottom of the pyramid where it says Novus Ordo Seclorum, what they're talking about is Novus is new, Ordo is order, Seclorum is world, the entire world minus God. So we're talking about a new world order without God. We have little time left. So much of what they've done has been implemented and we can see that they were able to do a lot of this through fractional reserve banking. That was accomplished several times. We had central banks here in America, even when they weren't supposed to be, when the people were against them. Oh, and they never dared to call it a central bank. But essentially, that's what it was. The, for, the War of 1812 was fought just because people weren't going to have a central bank. But by 1816, at the Treaty of Ghent, we had another central bank here in America. Through this fractional reserves, they are able to change prosperity and poverty. It's all done through the discount. Uh, if you lower the price that you lend to the member banks, they can in turn lower the price that they lend to their banks, who in turn can lower the price that they lend to people. And if it's low enough, people are going to go out there and borrow money and use it and get themselves trapped, not realizing how badly they are pinned in. Because all it takes is a little change on that lever and they start taking money out of the system. And when they take the money out of the system, it becomes sluggish. Just like you, if somebody took one-third of the blood out of your body, it would affect you. Well, that's what happened here. They told us that the Great Depression was brought on by people who were investing in the stock market on a shoestring. And because they had only 10% down, they had great marginal swings uh, caused by the leverage of that debt. But the real truth of the matter is, the thing that really brought it down was they removed one-third of the money from circulation. So with that lever, they can move things up and down, up and down, and as it goes up, people run out, oh, prosperity is here, let me jump in on the bandwagon and get my fair share, and about the time they do, about the time they think they're leveraged up and ready to roll so they're going to make some money with their new business, all they got to do is lever it back down. And then they go in and collect through forfeiture. Do you know how many homes are being scooped up by the banks right now? I think it's so close to the end policy, the end time game here that some of these smaller bankers are going to find out that they're getting pinched in this thing too. See, it's only the fattest of the fat cats that they really intend to have survive and prosper. They're trying to wipe out the whole middle class. I don't feel like I'm middle class anymore. I feel like I have been reduced to the impoverished. Life is not the same as it used to be. We just do not have the same kind of prosperity that we once had. 
And if they can have their way, and I see no reason why people in authority with as much power and leverage as they've got, it's going to be difficult to stop them from having their way. We're all going to be reduced to abject penury. Life where you, bring up, you, won't have, you won't have two nickels to rub together. You may have a whole pocket full of million dollar bills to rub together, but they won't buy anything. Now, after World War I, they had this big conference in which they brought together all the people involved in the war to have a settlement and a signing of the armistice with Germany. On one side of the table was Paul Warburg. On the other side of the table was his brother Max Warburg. In total there were 117 of these false Jews, as I prefer to call them. And we would not know about this except one of the guys there, a guy by the name of Benjamin Friedman, who was the bag man for Henry Morgenthau Sr. He became a Christian. And he decided he could not live with the secrets that he held. And he started talking about what had transpired, what the real game plan was, who was involved in it, and what their plans were for our future. An unseemly pl plan for our future. Much of that was done with these what you call false flag operations. A false flag operation is where you go in and pretend to be somebody else, do something wrong, so that the people that you attack think, hey, it was those people that did it to me when it really wasn't those people that did it to you. We find that a whole lot of that is done by these false Jews. For example, the Lusitania was sunk to start World War I. Now Germany had taken out advertisements in the New York newspapers and said very specifically that they were carrying munitions aboard that Lusitania. Don't, write, don't go on it. Well, while they were doing that, they ended up sending off some of that ships and with 100, well, 128 American passengers aboard it. And it wasn't Germany, it was Great Britain that sunk that ship to suck us into that war. They, they were having trouble. See, Germany was already winning. And they didn't like the idea at all. And so these characters went over to the King of England and said to the King of England, Now, you don't have to surrender to Germany. If we can bring America in on your side, if we can cause America to start fighting your battles for you, would you support a homeland in Palestine for us. And the king of England was, what do I do? Uh, do I surrender or do I agree to let somebody else have that home? Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll support that. So in November of 1917, the king of England sent a letter called the Balfour Declaration to Lord Rothschild, whom he called the most eminent Jew. I think he should have called him the most eminent false Jew because the real Jewish people have absolutely nothing to do with this new world order, this aggrandizement of power and the passion to dominate others. This is all among these Khazar warriors that only pretended to embrace Judaism in 741 AD. We find that as time went on, that we run across some of these things that these characters have done. And it was in May of 1919 at Dusseldorf, Germany, that the Allied forces 
obtained a copy of the communists' rules of revolution. Now, you've got to remember that communism was their front, too. When we find out the names of some of these characters, you realize, yes, this web is more intertangled than what you might realize. And we find that some of the characters, like Karl Marx, his real name was Kissel Moses Mordecai Levy. Karl Marx was just an assumed name. And he worked with people over there like Lenin, whose real name was Ulanov, and the commissar of the Red Army and Navy called Leon Trotsky. His real name was Lev, Devada, but Lev Devadovich Bronstein. And when you find out how all these people have been pulling together to foment so many of these things going on here, you should be forewarned. Because this is not just accidental history. This is conspiracy. People working together to do wrong. And it, by definition, a conspiracy is just two or more people planning in secret to do something wrong. And by that definition, there must be thousands, millions, maybe even billions of conspiracies going on all the time. But you mentioned something about what's going on. Oh, that's one of them conspiracy nuts. We've all been vilified by that label. Conspiracy nut is kind of like anti-Semite. It's just a buzzword to say, they're on to us. They know who we are. They know what we're up to. Let's jump on them and vilify them. And that's the way they operate, through vilification. And if vilifying isn't enough, they'll trump up some charges. And if that's not enough, they sent in the wet agents to spill some of your blood. Well, in Dusseldorf, Germany, the communist revolution, uh, rules of revolution came to light. And in 1946, a US attorney general uh, obtained a copy of the same rules from a known member of the Communist Party. And today, these same rules are in effect. And I want you to compare these concepts with modern occurrences. There's three of them, A, B, C. A, corrupt the young, get them away from a religion, get them interested in sex, make them superficial, and destroy their ruggedness. We sure have a lot of whips today. Some, a lot of these young kids coming up just don't seem to have what it takes anymore. But they've been through the public fool system. They've been nurtured by their television. And it's hard to think anymore. It used to be when you went to school, they taught you how to think. Now you go to school, they teach you what to think. B, get control of all means of publicity. Thereby, and there's seven parts to that, get people's minds off their government by focusing their attention, attention on athletic, sexy books, plays, and other trivialities. And boy, have we become trivial. Two, divide the people into hostile groups by constantly harping on controversial matters of no importance. Number three, destroy the people's faith in their natural leaders by holding the latter up to contempt, ridicule, and disgrace. Four, always preach true democracy but seize power as fast and as ruthlessly as possible. Number five, by encouraging government extravagance, destroy its credit, produce fear of inflation with rising prices and general discontent. That one has really been implemented with vigor. We're playing, playing, playing welfare Santa Claus to the whole world. Now take a look at Israel alone. We send $15,500 for every man, woman, and child. That's a lot of money. 
Sometimes I think some of us wish, wish gee, I wish my government would give me that much each year. Now that's only the above board welfare. There is a sub rosa welfare. For example, that's our only friend in the Middle East. Therefore, we've got to have a base over there to protect them. Do they give us a base or do they rent it to us at a high price? Well, since we never find out exactly how much it's going to be, they can rent it at a high price and nobody counts it as part of the great welfare. Number six. Incite unnecessary strikes in vital industries, encourage civil disorder, and foster a soft and lenient attitude on the part of government to such disorder. Number seven, by specious argument, call the breakdown of the old moral values, honesty, sobriety, self-restraint, faith in the pledged word, and ruggedness. So those are the seven reasons they wanted to get a hold of means of publicity so they could implement that. And number C of the communist rules of revolution, cause the registration of all firearms on some pretext with a view to confiscating them and leaving the populace helpless. So many of these false flag operations have gotten us into big trouble. We know now that that ship, I think it was the main or the, that was sunk down there in Cuba. We were told it's because the Spanish had mined the harbor, but we now know that the explosion took place inside the ship. It was all the excuse they needed to go attack and wage war against Spain. We see so many of those false flag operations. World War II, it was Pearl Harbor. It wasn't a false flag operation, but it was sure close to it. It was pretending like we're just innocent people standing here when six months before Pearl Harbor, our government froze all Japanese money in banks. Any way you look at it, that's theft. Three weeks before Pearl Harbor, our government gave him a 100% oil embargo. Do you remember back in the 70s when we got a 10% oil embargo from the Arabs and the lines at the gas pumps were long and we suffered under that? That was a 10% oil embargo. And our government tried to run a 100% oil embargo upon those people who just weren't going to put up with it. Now, I think Admiral Yamamoto was right that when they came over and stung us, they were only waking a sleeping lion. But there was nothing else they could do. It's either knuckle under or fight. And that's where it is to us. It's getting down to the point where you, we either knuckle under or do something to fight about this. Right now, it's a fight of words because, quite frankly, we're in a very awkward position here. It's too late to work within the system and probably too early to start shooting. And I think there's a whole lot of us here in America that really and truly are gutless. And it's only going to be the land of the free as long is it's the home of the brave. Well, we can see that after World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, whose real name was Rosenfeld, hooked up with his good buddy over in the Soviet Union, a guy by the name of Joseph Stalin. His real name was Joseph Vizaranovich Jugashvili. Gashvili means son of. And 
he let his good buddy Joseph Stalin oversee the elections in much of Europe. And ironically, all those people decided to become pawns in the communist superstate. It was Joseph Stalin that said so clearly, and he, we better pay attention to what he has to say, those who cast their votes decide nothing. Those who count the votes decide everything. And we saw that happen here not too long ago in America because George Bush got elected. And it was his brother down there in Florida that sure did a lot to swing the votes. Remember all those hanging and pregnant chads and all the excuses they had to not count a lot of votes and to count other ones that they shouldn't have. And it reared its ugly head here again in 2004 because down in Ohio, the people who were in charge of the election commission said to the people who were bringing in the voting machines, all right, open up your voting machines before the polls start here because I want to see ahead of time that all the registries are set to zero, that there are no names inside. And they said, oh, no, you can't look inside these machines. It's for security. It's for the sanctity of the vote. We must not let anybody look in the machines. And they said, we're the ones in charge of seeing whether or not the sanctity of the vote is taken care of. You're going to open up those machines right now. And there was a lot of protesting, a lot of weeping, and a lot of wailing, but they did end up opening up those machines. Every machine had three to four hundred votes for Bush on it already. It was a big deal down in Ohio. It was on television, it was in the newspapers, but it just didn't make its way around the rest of America. Why? Who owns the newspapers? Who owns the television? Who owns the radio? The same people that own the voting machines. There's only four companies here in America that own voting machines, and every one of them are mafia affiliates. Now, these, these television stations, ABC, NBC, CBS, and the, all the rest of them that have any influence and any power whatsoever, got together and formed a new corporation. It's called News Election Services. And they're the ones that feed information into the news election services about what's transpiring in the election and getting information back out of it. And so they have control. And it matters not who we vote for. What really counts is who does the television and the newspaper announce to be the victor. It's important because at stake is not only our freedom, but if we don't have freedom, we don't pass it on to our children. And if they don't have it, they don't pass it on to our grandchildren. And it's important to me for subsequent generations to enjoy the treasures, the pearls, the gems of liberty. Liberty is that notion where you got a right to make a choice. You decide what's good for your life that somehow we've got to the point where you have to get a license for everything. But as long as the people don't speak up, as long as we don't do what's necessary to inform the others around us, as long as we act lethargically rather than robust and animated champions of liberty, it'll slip right through our fingers. I have to ask you, are you willing to crank it up? Are you willing to pass out more DVDs? Are you willing to talk to more people? Are you willing to do what's necessary to safeguard our Constitution? For it was, I think it was Daniel Webster that said, Safeguard your constitution, for miracles do not cluster. 
What has happened once in 6,000 years may never happen again. And if the American Constitution goes down, there will be anarchy in the world. Let's safeguard it like it's precious. Thank you.